The reading this evening is from Joshua chapter 11. It's on page 226. Joshua chapter 11, page 226, verses 1 to 23. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Achshpath, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Araba, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naphoth Dor, on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sands on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them over to you, over to Israel, slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to Greater Sidon, to, Mesrof, to Mizrefoth Maim, and to the valley of Mizrefoth on the east, until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burnt their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed, and he burned up Hazor itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord command, commanded Moses. So Joshua took the entire land, the whole country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah and the mountains of Israel with their foothills. From, Halak, from Mount Halak, which rises to Seir, to Baal Gad in the, in the valley of the Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time, except for the Hivites living in Gibeon. Not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israel, ter is Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. 
Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Thank you for that reading and wrestling with some of those strange and foreign words and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, First, as you were forewarned and I've greatly been anticipating just one or seven books to share with you. Um, First of all, our charity Amen which is really taking some major steps forward not, I have to add, due to me but to some extremely proactive trustees. One is right now, tonight in, (coughs) where's he tonight? In Mumbai, I think, visiting three of our projects in preparation for our trip of a lifetime at the end of September, beginning of October. Well, in addition to all the projects that we are currently supporting, every year we have an annual um, project that we majorly fundraise for. That's in, in, in ex- extra to everything else that we're raising funds for. And we have a project in Manila in the Philippines called the uh, SICAP Centre. We want to raise enough money to open a centre in the roughest, most run-down, most poor part of the Philippines called Tondo. And we're looking for £10,000. Uh, that shows you straight away that a little bit of money here goes a lot further in many of the developing countries. And we have a DVD. Please, these are free, please take one and you'll be able to go and visit there in Tondo, this, this rough area where there's a lot of violence and drugs, um, gangs, but also loads and loads of lovely people. I've preached there many times myself. And we want a centre where they can come, especially the youth, they can learn uh, some moral discipline, they can learn how to use computers. We want to have a bank of computers. We also want to give them Bible training and Bible studies. It's a fantastic opportunity, but we can't do anything unless we have the premises. So we're trying to raise £10,000 for that. Do get a DVD. Do get one of our promotional leaflets and pray and see what uh, God would have you to do. If you want to join a friend of mine, he's already going to go out there on his own uh, in November. Uh, Jonathan Brain from down in Chippenham. If you want to go with him, then you'd be welcome. Uh, He'd like some company and he's going to visit. He's an evangelist with counties and uh, he's decided he really wants to see what God is doing in the developing world. So get one of those leaflets, there'll be light, and do get one of the DVDs as well. We've got our own charity newsletter that comes out regularly that you can have a look at and our own newsletter. If you want to keep in touch with what we're doing, we send out a monthly update. Just sign your name on the bit of paper there next to our update and I know already some of you get it and you can be in touch with what's going on. Also do feel free to take one of these little cards. Oh yeah, one other thing to do with our charity. We have just launched an international cookbook called Taste and See. This has been uh, professionally produced. All the recipes have been tried out on one of our trustees who's put on quite a bit of weight as a result. His wife cooked everything. It's, it was designed and made by women, so it's really friendly. It opens up like that. If it gets dirty, you just wipe it off because it's got that sort of texture. And there's recipes from the Philippines here. If you want to try some of those from uh, Southeast Asia, from Nigeria, from, uh, oh, just all over the place, India, uh, Europe. It's really, oh, that looks good. I just saw on there, easy cheesecake. Whoa. Mm, anyway, uh, these are seven pounds and all the profit goes to Amen. So do have a look at that. The launch date isn't until September, so we're doing an early pre-launch on that one. And then books, just a few classics. If you haven't read these, then you need to. Calvary Road by Roy Hessian used to be required reading on Operation Mobilisation. The fact that the road following Jesus is the road of the cross. It's got a forward by George Verwer and added notes by Lynn Green, Director of Youth with a Mission. Calvary Road, a classic. It wouldn't take you long to read it, but uh, although it's short, it could have a major impact on your life. Another classic, of course, is Pilgrim's Progress. I'm amazed how many Christians have never read Pilgrim's Progress. This is in modern English. This is the book that's been translated into more languages than any other except the Bible. Pilgrim's Progress. Really just a wonderful, wonderful story. John Bunyan, a dream that he had while he was in prison. And then, of course, Charles Finney on Revival. 
one of the modern classics, a man whom God used in a fantastic way, uh, really the apostle of revival in the 19th century. It's estimated a quarter of a million people were converted as a result of his preaching. Again, these are all very slim books, easy to take away on holiday. And then this book that's just come out is a biography of Billy Graham by one of the correspondents of uh, Time magazine, who's also a believer. It's called on the back, One Man Who Changed the World. He's preached in person to more than 210 million people in 185 nations. Still alive, although physically very, very weak now. And uh, yeah, we had his grandson, met his grandson, preaching on the, uh, on the Logos Hope. Well, I say his grandson, it's... Can you have a grandson-in-law? It's not direct, but it's his granddaughter's husband. And uh, he preached a good message. And actually, on the Logos Hope, in three days, I met Billy Graham's grandson, I met Louis Palau's son, and I met George Verwer's grandson. Isn't it great? The next generation, and the next two generations, still going on working for God. So that was a wonderful, wonderful encouragement. And then, Jeff Lucas, if you've heard him speak at Spring Harvest, a great comedian, but a great Bible teacher. Grace Choice is very easy to read, but really makes you think. I think Steve Chalksey wished that he could write like, uh, like Jeff Lucas did. John Piper, classic. Let the nations be glad. How, what does the Bible have to say about missions? This book will tell you. It's one of the required reading, actually, in a quite a number of Bible schools. This will open your eyes big time. The whole of the Bible is about missions. And then finally, a book I mentioned this morning, Genius, Grief and Grace. This is the work of 10 years of writing by Dr. Gaius Davies, who's both a medical doctor and a doctor of psychiatry, who sat under Martin Lloyd-Jones' ministry. What he's done is, he's looked at some famous Christians, names that are known, uh, including Martin Lloyd-Jones actually, J.B. Phillips, C.S. Lewis, Amy Carmichael, Christina Rossetti, Lord Shaftesbury, William Cooper, John Bunyan, Martin Luther. He's looked at their lives and shown how each of them had serious weaknesses. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a control freak, basically. Amy Carmichael was prone to histrionics. They had some glitches in their personality, like you and I. Nice to know, isn't it? And yet, despite that, God used them. So this isn't a critical book, it's more a, a book of encouragement as he looks at these lives and shows how All of us are fatally flawed in different ways and yet God still uses us. What an encouraging book. And very well written. A classic. I recommend it. Many other books too. Many other bits of free literature (coughs) at the back. Great. So what did you make of uh, Joshua chapter 11? Did your mind sort of glaze over as the sixth totally unknown name of a place went past you and yet again you heard about a whole group who were utterly destroyed and you sort of switched off or wondered what's this about or maybe you wonder what's the preacher going to say about this remember I used to do that when I was a young Christian I used to look ahead at what our pastor was going to preach on and thought how on earth is he going to manage to speak on anything positive from that years later I said to him I used to say, Pastor, I used to look at the, the passage you were going to preach at the next week and think, what on earth are you going to get out of that? And he'd say, Gareth, I'd do exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua 11. Well, it's the little heading you've got in the notes here, it says, God's power. Hyphen, Gareth Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, well, God's power, let's put it in a sentence. So, To give you a title, I thought to unpack it a bit, how to know and experience God's power. Can we find that in this chapter of Endless Bloodshed? How to know and experience God's power? Well, let's see. Let's just pray and then we'll look at this together. Father, I ask now that you'd help me to share your truth. We don't want to hear just what I've got to say, but what your spirit has to say through your word. And just ask now you'd open our hearts and make us attentive even though we might be feeling a bit tired on this warm evening nonetheless Lord your word is a living word and we pray that it would open up your truth to our hearts 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what is really remarkable here about Joshua chapter 11? What is really remarkable is that at first sight, there is nothing remarkable. You've been going through Joshua, is that correct? So you would have seen some pretty spectacular things, including last week. I presume Joshua 10 last week, was it? So, of course, there's the story, the remarkable story of running around, the, walking around, marching around the walls, and then blowing their trumpets and shouting, and the whole thing collapses. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? And then there's the story of the waters of the Jordan backing up. Again, supernatural exceptional happenings. And then last week, you had a double dose, didn't you? Those of you who were here, you have the account of these gigantic hailstones falling down. This is chapter 10, verse 11. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down, down on them from the sky. And more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. Wow. Massive hailstones. And then just a few verses later, that unforgettable experience that only ever comes once in the Bible of the sun standing still. don't know what your preacher said about this last week. wish I could have been here. But the sun stood still. Look at it. There in the next few verses after the hailstones. Verses 13 and 14. Let me read it. So the sun stood still. Well, go back one verse, verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Wow! Spectacular, supernatural stuff. Well, this week there is nothing spectacular. There's nothing like that. There's nothing overtly supernatural about this passage. And some people are always looking for the spectacular. Are not happy unless they are seeing or experiencing some miraculous happening. So much so that, I don't know if you've met people like this, they seem to lose sight of God. In the ordinary. God in the mundane. God in the routine. God at home. God in the workplace. It's often where God meets people, if you look in the Old and New Testament. It's actually in very much in, in the daily task, in what we do each day. And what is very dangerous, if you're always hankering after the dramatic, is you forget that the most wonderful miracle of all, miracle of all, which is almost always unseen, is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing somebody from darkness to light. Somebody from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God the work of salvation. What greater miracle can there be in the life of an individual? And as I say, this persistent desire for signs and wonders can often give people almost uh, an impatience when it comes to prayer. There's, prayer is unnecessary almost in the thinking of some of these people. We just want to see something really dramatic happening. And people have said to me, They've actually said, if we had more spectacular, dramatic signs and wonders, people would be more likely to flock into the kingdom of God. Well, I stand to be corrected, but I'm not so sure that's true. Jesus later said this about some unbelievers. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So there's nothing dramatic. I can't unpack to you some supernatural happening. Unless, of course, there is one thing that is incredible, that's crucial to the whole outcome of this chapter. Verse 20 says this. 
he hardened their hearts. An unseen thing, as is so often the case in our hearts. But it changed the whole direction of this chapter. God doesn't need the obviously miraculous or some special intervention to give us victory. Now, God does sometimes use miracles and spectacular answers to prayer. I guess I would count getting the flight in Bermuda in all sorts of incredible ways and getting back. And you know, the Sunday that I arrived back for, which I would have missed, at that very meeting just outside Birmingham, a number of people committed and recommitted their lives to Jesus Christ. But God can work without that. Sometimes he sends it, but if all the time you're just looking for this supernatural breakthrough, then you could be very disappointed and actually miss out what God is doing in the day-to-day and in the mundane. So what sort of heart did these people have before God hardened them? Well, the chapter begins with a rather ominous ring to it. Did you note the early words, the opening words? when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this. What had he heard? What was it that so alarmed him? What was it that stirred him into action? Well, you see, chapter 9, sorry, chapter 10, is all about the conquering of the southern kingdoms. Chapter 11, which we've just read, is all about the conquering of the northern kingdoms. So what is it he'd heard? Well, he'd heard about the southern kingdoms. He was a king of the north, okay? News came to him that in the southern kingdom there had been an earlier attack by Joshua that was utterly devastating. I don't know if you were here last week or can remember back to last week, but we have the same phrase six times in six verses of chapter 10. And the phrase is, they left no survivors. When Hazor, Jabin, king of Hazor, heard this, he sent word. They left no survivors. Nobody was left to tell the tale. The whole of the next generation had been virtually wiped out. That's what the king of the north hears. No wonder he's alarmed. So what does he do? What's his response to such total annihilation? How does he react? This has been an awesome demonstration of the power of God. He's at a crossroads. He has a choice as to how he's going to react. What does he do? It's decision time. And he's got a choice of two ways that he can turn. God's power has been clearly demonstrated. People have been annihilated by the leader of the Israelites. Those who worship the Lord God. Those who say there is only one Lord God. What conclusion does he draw? He hears about these things. Faith comes through hearing and hearing comes through the word of God. So he has heard, okay? He's heard what's gone on, now he has to make a choice. You're sitting here this evening, you've heard about God. You have made, or you are making a choice, right now. Some of you will have made the choice, yes, this is the God I'm going to give my life to, this is the God I'm going to serve. Others of you will have heard and you're taking really the road of Jabin. You are deciding to go your own way. In fact, more than that, you're deciding to rebel against the Lord God despite the fact that you've seen and heard his great power. And there are consequences for whatever choice you take. And we're just about to see the consequences that utterly tragic consequences that happen when Jabin has heard what God has done, he's seen what God has done, and decides, because he has freedom to decide, to go his own way and not submit to that power. I mean, I could spend the whole time on this first verse. 
It's incredibly challenging. He's heard. There was no excuse. He's seen and still he decides that he's not going to go the way that clearly is being indicated to him. Do you notice that uh, earlier on in the book of, of Joshua there were others who heard. Rahab, way back in chapter 2, she was in the same position really as, as, as Jabin was. She knew the news. What's, what's Rahab's reaction in chapter 2? Let me just read it to you. Verse 10. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. For when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, whom you completely destroyed, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. And then look what she says. For the Lord God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She heard. She had a choice. The choice for Rahab had incredible consequences because believe it or not, she becomes part of those in the great list of the genealogy in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what is tragic about this passage is that it says not one city made a peace treaty with the Israelites. There was a choice, you see. They'd heard. They knew what the power was. And in their blindness and in their rebellion, not one city. And so they were all defeated in battle as a result. And you see, there are, there are those people today who say, well, I'll think about these things later. I, I will turn to Christ later. God may harden your heart because you deliberately rejected the evidence that's been presented to you. That's the bottom line. Deliberate rejection of the truth will always result in hearts being hardened. And of the many tribes, actually only one saw the light. Only one brokered a peace treaty. Did you see that in verse 18? It was the Hivites or Hivites living in Gibeon. They realised. They made peace. They understood. This was no normal battle. This was no different army, this was an army in whom God was the leader and God was directing them. You see, the people in this land were basically squatters. The land didn't belong to them. They were not there by right. And we know they were very wicked and godless people. We know that they defied many of the acceptable values of moral decency. This was the land promised to Abraham. They heard, but unfortunately, it didn't result in faith, it resulted in opposition. All these tribes had a choice, they could have been incorporated, like the, those in Gibeon, the Hivites, like Rahab, there was a choice, there was an open invitation, there was an opportunity, and all of them decided to reject they refused to acknowledge who God was, what God had done, and they had to face the consequences. And the same is true for us today. I mean, it's a clear gospel application here. You don't have to look very far. We have a choice. You have a choice. Submit or rebel. And there will be serious consequences on whichever side you happen to go. There's no middle line. I was talking to a guy when we were doing some door-to-door -door work in Gravesend. He said, oh, I'm sitting on the fence. I said, friends, there's no fence to sit on. There is no fence. You're either on one side or you're on the other. You could draw a line down the middle of this church and God could put everybody on one side, uh, on one side and, and the people on the other. He could actually make a division between those who are for him and those who are against him. Jabin decides to take on the Lord's people. Actually, he decides to take on God himself to confront God. Can I say again, he didn't have to. He wasn't compelled to. There was an opportunity to realise what God was doing and to join in with it, but he chose to go his own way. Praise God for those who 
open-heartedly evaluate the evidence and choose to make their peace with God. Now, there's something else you need to realise. This is the largest army Joshua has ever faced. This is enormous. It's far bigger than the southern kingdom. It's the entire northern kingdom. It's, it's a fight that's, in one sense, parallel to the fight against the southern kingdom, except this was much larger number of people, a more fearsome than people, and noticed they possessed, and we mentioned this in verse 4, horses and chariots. In fact, it says, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Sand on the seashore? What does that mean? Well, when you look at sand, you can't see the individual grains, can you? And there were so many chariots and horses, you couldn't pick out the individual, you couldn't count them. They were beyond counting. A huge army. And that phrase, horses and chariots, comes only eight times in the Bible. And one of the places where you'll remember it mentioned first, and perhaps most significantly, is in the horses and chariots of Pharaoh that pursued the Israelites across the parted Red Sea in Exodus chapter 13, 15. So this isn't just another skirmish. This is an enormous battle. And Jabin, we're told, is king of Hazor. Hazor was multiple, multiple times bigger than Jerusalem. You've probably never heard of Hazor. I hadn't until I started studying this. Hazor was a metropolis. It's 40,000 people. It made Jerusalem look like a, a village. It was colossal. And he had to take on a far larger and a far better equipped army. Now, to you, horses and chariots, friends, chariots were the advanced war machinery of their day. They were personnel carriers, really, armed personnel carriers. They were like our equivalent tanks, I suppose. They, they struck terror, moving rapidly with the, with the horses and with the soldiers armed and defended. The Israelites didn't have these. One commentator says they weren't allowed to have them. The Israelites had donkeys, mules, not horses and chariots. So, when you look at this, this was an unequal battle, okay? It's like your local territorial army arriving in Red Square on May the 1st and taking on the whole Russian military parade. You know May the 1st, where they have these parades with the latest strategic missiles and it just seems endless line of them coming one after the other. There's something like the equivalent It's going to be a miracle if he wins, isn't it? The challenge is enormous. What does he have to do? Well, he's told in verse 6, not many details, but you have to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. I knew nothing about hamstrings until two months ago. <laughs> I've been jogging for 40 years. Ever since I started teaching, I've been jogging. When I started jogging back in, uh, what, 1971, there weren't many people jogging. You get people, you know, stopping in their cars and winding down the windows. People didn't do jogging then. Nowadays, you know, what with the marathon and everything. And I never had a problem. I mean, I did have a major accident, but I came through that. Until the Bahamas, of all places, on the Logos Hope. I've been on a long run. It was an hour. I was coming back, I was in sight of the ship and suddenly, on the back of the thigh, oh, it's like I was poleaxed. I was so pleased I was within sight of the ship. If I'd been half an hour away from the ship, it would take me the whole day at the best to get back so I haven't got any money. The hamstring, it totally finishes you, man. I just hobbled back in and uh, I'm still not completely through it. I jogged for 40 minutes yesterday, which is the most I've done for a long time. The hamstring is a vital part of, of your whole running process. But if you hamstring a horse, it's useless. It can't move any further. You burn a chariot, well, of course, that's the finishing. And of course, horses have always been an important part of the world there. They still are today, aren't they? Arabs love horses. Thoroughbred Arabian horse is a beautiful sight. And even the Dubai has, a, I think, the Grand National or a, a National Racehorse now. 
the classic. Where is all this happening, by the way? Well, it's happening, according to verse 5, at the waters of Merom. Doesn't it strike me as a very good place for chariots? That's what happened to the Egyptians, didn't it? The chariot wheel, which is quite thin, got stuck in the mud. The waters of Merom are a great swampy area in Israel with sort of peat underneath. They tried some years ago to drain it and to make the land useful for building, but I don't think it's really ever worked out. So it was not a good choice to have a chariot. In fact, it's a very watery area. In verse 2 it talks about, do you see the word there, kinnereth? Don't miss kinnereth in verse 2. That's in the New Testament, Galilee, okay? Kinnereth, Chinnereth, Old Testament equals Galilee, New Testament. So, between Galilee, going north, you have the waters of Merom. So, not a bright idea to start having chariots there. But a bright idea in one sense, because it's a crossroads, it connects east, west, north, south. But from a military point of view, well, uh, they should have thought again. Muddy ground is not conducive for battles involving chariots. You thought they would have learned that from Egyptian history. Do you know, nobody knows when the Battle of Waterloo began. Exactly. Napoleon says it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Duke of Wellington said no, it was 11.30. Part of the reason that nobody knows when it started was because Napoleon deliberately delayed the start because in that part of Belgium there had been extremely heavy rainfall. And he knew that it was not a good idea to start engaging in battle, manoeuvring horse and heavy artillery, because it wouldn't have moved along the ground. So we have history repeating itself. But in those days, the waters of Merom were not something they'd really thought through. And so he attacks He defeats them through the geography, or maybe I should say the topography. He goes to the east to defeat them. If you follow all this on a map, he then goes to the west, destroying all the cities. He defeats them all, especially the Anakim, verse 22. Do you remember the Anakim? These were the race of giants that really put fear into the Israelites when Joshua and Caleb came to spy out the land. Do you remember the Anakim? I think they were called the Nephilim, but the Anakim, descendants of the Nephilim. They were described as great and mighty, like giants. Well, they might well be physically, but when the Spirit of God is at work, <laughs> there's no contest. And while no Anakites were left in Israel, it was only in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod, it says here, that a few survived. So all those in Israel were exterminated, but just those in that area, verse 22, Gaza, Gath and Ashdod, they survived. And do you remember there was a giant later who came out from Gath? That's right. Goliath of Gath, the Philistine. Do you know what that area is today? The Gaza Strip. So all the Anakites were destroyed in Israel, but some went down to Gath, Gaza and Ashdod and survived. You see, Joshua, from a human point of view, was a military genius, actually. He knew the power of surprise attacks. I mean, you remember that from last week in chapter 10. Look at verse 9, it says, after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. All-night march, by goodness, they must have been exhausted. But he got there in the morning, they weren't expecting it, bang! Surprise attack. And so he goes up to the waters of Merom, he takes the battle to them. Good strategic thinking. Yes, God was working, but God had his man, the right man, in the right place. Now, how long did it last, this battle? Was this a sort of Sunday afternoon's jaunt for him? Just 
destroy them all and then go back. And... Well, you might be tempted to think that, and certainly that initial battle was. But it lasted much longer. It says in verse 18, Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. One commentator says it probably lasted up to eight years. Imagine fighting battles for eight years. If you're a Christian, you'll be fighting battles all your life. You can never have a spiritual holiday, can you? Very dangerous. Just leave this Christian thing for a bit and go and do my own thing. Deadly. Eight years of fighting to bring these people. And the last verse tells us, then the land had rest from war. Great, starts with war and ends with rest. Where does the war start? Well, it doesn't start at the beginning of chapter 11. It starts back in Jericho. This has been a continuous thing. You've had Jericho, then you've had AI going right up here. And finally, end of chapter 11, they had rest. So what do we learn about this passage? Remember my subject is knowing and experiencing God's power. What do we learn? Can I just leave you with three things? First of all, Obedience to God's word is the number one requirement which is repeatedly set before Joshua. Now this is the secret of Joshua's success, is his obedience. It's not his military genius, it's not the strategy that he employs, it's his obedience to God's word. You, it's repeated in this chapter. Um, verse 9 Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. Here's a man under orders. Verse 12. Joshua totally destroyed them as the Lord, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. So it was commanded to Moses. The Lord said, as I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. So here's the direct descendant of Moses. He stepped into Moses' very large shoes and he's carrying on the work that Moses started. Obedience to God's word. Verse 15. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Victory depends on obedience to God's promises, not on miracles. God will always use an obedient person with his or her natural gifts for his glory. Ordinary people. Dale wrote on with George Verwer and one other guy in 1957 went to Mexico Three men. Today, Operation Mobilisation is what? Six and a half thousand people. Dale Roton, who's the guy you don't hear so much about, pioneered the work in Turkey, Eastern Europe, and the ships. And Dale was in a big meeting being interviewed. The interviewer said, now Dale, what's been the secret of your magnificent success in Operation Mobilisation? And Dale looked a bit nonplussed by the question. He said, well, I read the Bible. Yes, yes, but what, come on, what, how is it that you've been able to do what you've done? Well, I, I read the Bible and do what it says. I think Christian story is about an extraordinary God in very ordinary people. Honestly. So all the glory goes to him, not to you and I. But it demands obedience to God's word. Joshua obeyed totally. King Saul didn't. He was told to king to kill Agag and the Amalekites. And then, when confronted later, it's clear that he hasn't done totally what God told him to do. So that's the first thing. Obedience to God's word is key to having an effective life. Second thing is, obedience means being brave and going forward even when you're outnumbered. I'm amazed, you know, and you must have picked this up. How many times did God say to Joshua, be brave? I, I haven't counted it up. It's astonishing. Be brave. 
Have courage. Do not fear. It's a repeated mantra that comes to this man. I mean, the very first chapter of Joshua, verses 6 to 9. Let me just read it. Count up. How many times does it say here, don't be afraid? Verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give you. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Verse 8. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Courage. There's something about seeing courage in action, isn't there? I don't know anything that that stiffens your spine more than to see somebody being brave. I am not a brave person. I am naturally a coward. Really, I'm a devout, I'm a religious coward, I'm a devout coward, okay? A yellow streak goes right through the middle of me. It really, honestly does. But the command is, be brave. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Because I'm with you. Athanasius, have you heard of him? Athanasius was an early bishop of Alexandria who stood alone against the teaching of Arius. Arius taught that Jesus was not the eternal Son of God, but was subordinate to God in his being. Athanasius stood alone against that doctrine. He was constantly hounded, and it is said he went into exile five times. The emperor Theodosius demanded he cease his operation to Arius. The emperor said to Athanasius, Do you not realise that all the world is against you? Athanasius replied, then I am against all the world. That's conviction. Today, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Athanasius, who stood against the heretical teaching that threatened to engulf the whole church. And it's just the Jehovah's Witnesses and a few others (coughs) who hold on to that teaching today. Obedience means being brave even when you're outnumbered. Do you feel outnumbered? In your office, do you feel outnumbered? In your neighbourhood, in your road, in your family? Do you feel in the minority? Well, I think we all do at times. And the devil wants you to play the numbers game. He says, there's only you. What effect can you have? You're surrounded by mainly non-Christians or people who don't understand. Why bother? Give up. Who's going to listen to you? Here in post-modern Britain, don't bother. Keep your mouth shut. I mean, this was fundamentally once a Christian society. Britain was. We had Christian values. Even if many didn't understand the values or didn't know why they were obeying them, a Christian consensus pervaded society on issues of morality, on issues of honesty and integrity. Today we have MTV values. We are in the minority, sure. But we always will be. That's not a reason for battening down the hatches and going into survival mode. Here's an opportunity to make a difference. Do you believe you can make a difference? One person making a difference? I do. I totally believe it. If the creator of the universe lives in our hearts, how can we not make a difference? It's a denial of what we believe. Don't let the devil say, oh, there's only one of you, look at all those out there, you're not going to make a difference, be quiet, batten down, don't say anything in the office, don't say anything in the home, don't say anything in the neighbourhood, you might lose your popularity, they'll laugh at you. I think we'll be surprised when we find out those who have been observing us, perhaps people we didn't even realise, they noticed what we've said and what we've not said, how we've reacted. We'd be amazed. Obedience means being brave, going forward, 
even when you're outnumbered. And finally, not only does it, are we required to be obedient to God's word, not only are we to be brave and go forward, but thirdly, obedience means walking by faith, not by sight. Do you notice, Joshua had very few details about how he was to fight his battles. And not just Joshua, I mean, you look at anybody in the Bible, Gideon, Moses. God always said, this is how it's going to end, this is, what the, this is going to be the conclusion, now you just go forward. And I'm sure, particularly in Joshua 1, God keeps saying, be strong, be brave. Joshua says, yeah, okay, okay, now how do I do it? This is how you do it. I am with you, be strong, be brave. Yes, yes, I, I understand that you're with me, I, I know you. How do I do it? Just go forward. My presence is with you, my grace is sufficient. God isn't in, into giving the details, he could do, he could give you the details. He could say, I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay, fine, I'll just get a pen and a bit of paper, where are we? Okay, right. Okay, right, is it? What do you want me to do, God? I'm listening. You are with me. Okay, yeah, I know that you're with me. Yeah, be strong and brave. Yeah, be strong and brave. God, just tell me how to do it. Uh oh. We walk by faith, not by sight. He just says, go forward, trust me, be brave, and at the end of the story, I'll tell you what's going to happen in the end. This is what's going to happen in the end. Gideon, you'll defeat all the Midianites. Joshua, you will have total victory over all of not just the southern, but also the northern kingdoms. He promises us his presence. He does not promise us his plans. How frustrating, but that's how it is with God. That's why we live by faith, and without faith it's impossible to please him. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. When you go to war against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. Verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. My dear friends, God has given us firm and sure promises. Whatever situation you face now, or you and I are going to face in the coming week, this is a great reminder. All of us are part of a far bigger picture of God's purposes and the spiritual warfare we are all called to. We are constantly battling against wickedness primarily against uh, the depravity often in our own hearts, but also in the wickedness around us. Okay, we, we won't face physical armies, we don't face hailstones, so we don't have hailstones coming down, but we're encouraged to hold fast without wavering, trusting God in the difficulties, for he is faithful who promised. Let's stop and consider these things and then watch the results when our trust is ultimately in God alone. That's what I picked up from Joshua chapter 11. There is victory if we obey his word, if we go forward in faith, and if we walk not by sight, but by faith. I'm encouraged. Let's pray. Father, these Old Testament passages are often secret treasure houses of stored truth. Thank you that although they were written many years ago to another people, in another time, in another language, in another culture, in another situation, still the principles are as relevant today as they were then. Help us to apply them, not in the ease of a Sunday church meeting, but in the challenge of a Monday morning meeting. Thank you, Lord, that all your resources are available and that you, an extraordinary God, can do extraordinary things in us, very ordinary people, as we give our lives to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.